Good evening. Uh, welcome to the General Society. And I would really like to thank you all so much for coming out on this really miserable, frigid night. It's much appreciated, and it's very good to see you. Um, I'm Karen Taylor. I'm the Program Director of the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen of the City of New York. And as I mentioned, I'm so pleased to welcome you here this evening. This is the labor component of the Labor, Literature, and Landmark Lecture Series. The Labor, Literature, and Landmark Lectures are supported in part by public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council. The General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen is a nonprofit organization that was founded in 1785. And I, Often I recap, I give you a brief overview of the history, but in fact, I'm going to suggest you read that blue postcard that has been left on the seat. The space you are in this evening is our library. Uh, this, this is the second oldest library in New York City and was founded in 1820. And I want to mention, for those of you who might be interested, particularly those of you who this might be your first visit, that if you, would like, if you were interested in becoming a library member, you will certainly find information on the back table. I also want to mention that after tonight's lecture, there will be a short wine and cheese reception that we do hope you will stay for. Now, this is the second of four labor lectures that will provide a behind-the-scenes look at the creative industries in New York focusing on the talented artists that provide the heartbeat of theater, cinema, and television. The series is curated by Beverly Miller, president of the local scenic artists, USA 829. Tonight, we're very fortunate to have Peter Negrini here as part of this series. Peter is an award-winning theatrical projection designer and production, but he's here tonight really to talk about the projection part. And he will discuss the craft and application of pro projection technology and how it is transforming the way theater is made and stories are being told in the 21st century. Some of Peter's most notable work includes the Broadway musical, Fila, Robert Woodworth's adaptation of Dostoevsky's Notes from the Underground and the public theater's acclaimed production of David Byrne's Here Lies Love, for which he won the 2013 Drama Desk Award for Outstanding Projection Design and the 2013 Hughes Design Award. Peter is currently designing for the Broadway revival, revival of the Heidi Chronicles and grounded at the public theater, which is a one-woman show starring Anne Hathaway as a US drone pilot. It is my great pleasure to introduce to you Peter Negrini. Uh, thank you. Thank you all for coming. Um, let me know if at any moment you can't hear me, but I imagine that we're a small enough group you can. Um, uh, where to begin? Um, well, it's, it's never a bad idea to start with a couple images, so I'm going to do that first uh, to show you a little bit of my work and also give you a little bit of an idea of the broad range of what projection in the theater might look like, because it's not always 100% clear what that even means. And you're, if you have some questions about what a projection designer does and what that means, you're not alone. <laughs> a lot of us spend a lot of time trying to figure out exactly what this new thing is. So to begin with, um, I'll show you a couple images of some recent work of mine and just briefly touch on those, and then we will try to answer the question, what is projection design? How do we do it? Why do we do it? You know, some things like that. Um, so as, uh, as was mentioned, I designed a production called Here Lies Love, which was at the public theater. It opened two springs ago, spring of 2013, I suppose. And uh, it came back in the spring of 2014, and then has since moved to London this past fall. Um, and if all goes according to plan, it will open in Australia this coming summer and San Francisco this fall. Um, in brief, it was a, a musical written by David Byrne in Fat Boy Slim um, that was a series of 
disco songs telling the life story of Imelda Marcos, um, which all sounds rather unpredictable. Um, uh, and part of it was driven by the fact that David was fascinated by sort of plutocrats like Imelda Marcos, who sort of live in their own universe. And as it turned out, she was a huge fan of disco and had a nightclub installed in the presidential palace in the Philippines and a disco ball in her New York apartment. So she was sort of the perfect melding of these worlds. Um, it included an, uh, an incredible amount of projection. It's probably the largest production I've ever done and probably was in one of the smallest spaces I've ever worked in. Um, we built a nightclub on the third floor of the public theater and packed into a room roughly the size of this library, uh, 200 people, uh, 16 video projectors, uh, 32 video monitors, and God knows what else, <laughs> and an entire company. So, and I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later as well when we start talking about the technology involved. Um, another recent production that was also mentioned was a very different piece, Notes from Underground, that I did, uh, was one of a series of adaptations I did with Robert Woodruff, uh, who is, I would argue, one of the greatest living American directors. Uh, he uh, spent the 70s directing all of the original productions of Sam Shepard um, and is just a, a, a revolutionary figure in the American theater. He has recently, we have been doing a series of adaptations. Uh, we did this adaptation of Dostoevsky and also several film adaptations including um, Autumn Sonata, Bergman's film, and the um, Fassbinder film, at A Year of Thirteen Moons. And I'll talk some more about Autumn Sonata a little bit later on. Um, and finally, uh, my work isn't entirely limited to the theater. Um, this is a photograph from the most recent tour uh, of Grace Jones. Uh, we put together a new tour for her uh, that was closed by Eiko Ishiaka, who's a, a brilliant costume designer. Um, and this involved a lot of live video and, as you can see, um, some rather extraordinary costumes. Um, <laughs> and Grace Jones. Um, uh, finally, uh, my work is also not in limited entirely to projection design. I also occasionally work as a set designer, as a lighting designer, on truly rare occasions as a costume designer, which is generally not a wise choice for me. <laughs> but, um, uh, and uh, so a couple of those things, I did a production years ago at uh, Lincoln Center Theater and the Lincoln Center Festival uh, called The Orphan of Zhao, which is a, an American adaptation of a Chinese fable um, that uh, you can't quite see what's going on there, but what we did is flooded the drama theater at LaGuardia High School with uh, 3,500 gallons of fake blood. Um, and then floated a piece, of, that platform was a piece of white paper that sat in the middle of that floor. Um, and we'll be taking that production to China later this spring. Um, and finally, uh, well, two other images I'll show you. One is a, a theater company that I work with a lot that I suspect no one's heard of. We mostly work in Europe, um, but we're a New York-based theater company called the Nature Theater of Oklahoma that I f it has not so much to do with Oklahoma <laughs> and a lot to do with a quote from a Franz Kafka novel that talks about the Nature Theater of Oklahoma. Um, and we've been working on a project called Life and Times, which has been a series of, what will have ultimately be a series of 10 performances, each of which is a full evening of theater, uh, telling the life story of one of our company members. Um, and we be, it, it is based on 10 recorded telephone calls, each of which was roughly an hour to two hours long. And the text is the verbatim text of her on the telephone telling us her life story. Um, and each one is wildly different. So this is actually episode three of 10. Um, and for this, the text revolved very much around sort of various mysterious happenings uh, in her life uh, as a teenager. Um, and so we thought to ourselves, what's the best way to, I mean, what is the most successful mystery and we thought the mousetrap, which ran for 60, is, has run for 60 plus years in London, in the West End. So we built a complete replica of the set of the mousetrap, but all as painted scenery, completely two dimensional. Um, and then built our show in that shape. So as you can see, there's a 
many things that I, I, I do and I'm interested in, and I think it's, it's interesting. It is part of the key. I was, interest, I was at a meeting at NYU, which is gonna start next year teaching a course in projection design. And they had amassed uh, perhaps a group of 10 or 12 people who work as projection designers, all different ages from some more senior than I to some students who had come through their program in the last five years. And we're asking the question, what, how do you teach a course on projection design? And what we ended up with was a lot of divergent opinions. <laughs> and no real consensus on what that was. But the most interesting thing in that room was that because there are no courses in projection design at the moment, or there, if there are, they have just begun in the last three or four years, you cannot, until four years ago, you could not go to school to study this. It was a craft that was learned, you know, speaking of labor and craftsmanship, it was a craft that was learned essentially through an ad hoc apprenticeship system. The way you became a projection designer was you figured out that's what you wanted to do and you went and found one. <laughs> and if you found one, you held on to them and just absorbed everything you could. And what it meant was that all of us were in a way polymath artisans. We had some experience as set designers, we had some experience as lighting designers. Uh, many of us have worked as graphic designers. Uh, some of us have worked as filmmakers. And all of those skills in any number of ways flow into what it is to be a, a projection designer. Um, so, I've skipped ahead. There's one other example I'll give you of my work, and then I'll get to the question of what that means. Um, this is a, a still from a film that I worked on that actually was working to integrate video projection in a documentary film about the life of Helen Keller. So what we would do was build realistic sets to contain these characters from her history, and then we would project archival images of Helen Keller or various documents or, mo or, or artifacts from her life into the, into the frame. So here you see uh, a, a, a character who is involved in her life and over his shoulder projected on the side of his house is an image of Helen, a period image of Helen Keller. So it was an interesting way about how you uh, work to integrate history and archival information into uh, a, a, a theatrical representation in a way, although this was for a film. So, uh, the question of what is projection design? <laughs> um, most importantly, it, it, projection design doesn't specifically address the technology involved in making an image. Often there are projectors involved, and it is an image that is technically projected from a slide projector, a video projector, something of that sort. But that's not always the case. Uh, there's other means of presenting an image on the stage. Um, LED screens like the giant billboards in Times Square, for example, um, televisions flat panel monitors, increasingly we're looking at new technologies that involve um, uh, sort of e-paper products, like the sort of surface of a Kindle reader, which is, a, which is a, not a, an object that emits light at all. It just changes the color of a surface. So that there's any number of technologies that are how we put an image on the stage. And as a group, we were faced with the question of what do we call our discipline? And we actually all sat down at a meeting. Um, and I think the moment that we sort of managed to crystallize around that was the moment that we were also organizing to join local A29 of the United Scenic Artists. And we said, well, we have to just have a name. And ultimately, what we adopted was projection design, even though it's technically somewhat potentially archaic that you know, at some point we may move past projectors as the way we put, it, put an image on stage. But it was the, the, what we could sort of all agree on as a historical precedent. Um, and so in the end, what we have chosen that term to encompass is any way that um, a uh, ephemeral image can be imprinted, imprinted on the stage. So it's not scenery. You know, that is, that is a, an image made of physical objects. Um, and it's not light, 
Because while light is a, is a tool to expose objects, it's not, in fact, imparting its own image onto the stage. Um, what we're doing is the boundary between the two, where essentially we use, um, in almost every case, we somehow are controlling light to make an image. And that can be as simple as a slide projector, a motion a video projector, any of those tools, an LED screen, that allow us to place an image into the theatrical context. Um, then you rapidly then get to the question of what image and what do those images do? And I think most importantly, and the, the, the first sort of step to get past in understanding what we're doing is we're not creating scenery. Um, for instance, in a production that 100 years ago would have used a series of painted backdrops to represent time and place. Projection design, while it can perform that function, we could get rid of all those painted backdrops and project images onto a single surface that are setting time and place for each scene. Um, the vast majority of the work that we're doing as projection designers and where I feel the real excitement is, is not, um, is not reproducing the function of scenery. It's not, let's project an image that someone is gonna perform in front of as a location. Um, instead, there's a sort of range of other things that, that I feel projection can do for the theater and that is more uh, sort of fundamental to the way stories are being told and the way that particularly stories need to be told in the future to allow the theater to continue to absorb the culture around us. Um, so I'd like to talk about a couple different examples of how it is that the, the projected image or projection design can be used in the theater and explain how they worked in those specific productions as sort of a guide to understanding what this might be. Um, the first of those is uh, I f there's times when uh, projection can sort of have a, a dramaturgical function where the experience of an audience of a projected image uh, is uh, directly related to the content of the play. So I'm gonna talk about a project production I did maybe six or seven years ago. It was a play by Jean Genet called Elle. And it had never been translated into English before. It's a one act play. And the entire premise of the production is that a, a gentleman has been brought to the Vatican to take a photograph of the Pope. And the entire production is a conversation between the photographer and the Pope. And it's really a rumination on what it means to be the Pope. Is the man himself the Pope? Or is the image of the man the Pope? And once we have the image of this man who is the Pope, do we really need the actual Pope anymore? <laughs> because once his image is reproduced and handed out to, uh, you know, uh, Catholics all over the world, that is his function. And what is, what is then the function of the Vatican as an organization built around the Pope, built to perpetuate this image? So there was a couple exciting things in this play, and Jean Genet was not a particularly devout Catholic, to say the least. So it wasn't something that was particularly kind to the, the established church, but there were interesting questions about not only Catholicism, which I don't think was really his point, but the nature of the reproduced image and celebrity. And so what was interesting, there was a couple things. First of all, it was stated that when the Pope finally arrived in this production, there were two things that were in the script. First was that he would arrive on roller skates because the Pope should not appear to touch the ground. So he should appear to float into the room. Um, and Genet's answer for doing this was for him to wear roller skates. The second was that there is actually no need to see the back of the Pope. No one, there's no image of the Pope where you need to see the back of the Pope. So Jean Genet says that he should not be costumed from the back. Um, and so that led us to uh, 
as we were exploring that, the director pointed out that Vivian Westwood had done a very famous uh, runway fashion show where she had designed a dress that existed only in the front. And the model would walk down the runway and everyone would see the front of the model. And the model would then get to the end of the runway, turn around, and reveal that there was literally no back to this dress that she was wearing. So then the obvious choice was to hire Vivian Westwood to come <laughs> and design papal vestments that were only the front half of the Pope's wardrobe. Um, so, and then the, the, the next step was that we then cast Alan Cumming to play the Pope. Um, with all of that, we were in a strange theater that uh, doesn't exist anymore, but it was called The Zipper. And the interesting thing about The Zipper was it was incredibly wide and very shallow, so that all of the audience sat um, maybe 50, 60 feet wide, and there was only five rows, and they were all looking at this giant blank wall. So the choice was to have the Pope enter not directly in front of the audience, but extremely down this far end, so that when the Pope finally entered, which was about halfway through the play, you really couldn't see him. Like, it was very uncomfortable to see the Pope. You had to sort of crane your neck, and you had to look around. And on top of that, it wasn't just anybody. It was a, it was a movie star, right? So it was, a, it was a human that you really wanted to see. Um, and he would enter like this on roller skates. But really, no one got this vantage point. This is taken from a, when the photographer was standing on stage. You couldn't ever really see him. What was on stage was a camera pointing at Alan Cumming playing the Pope. And the entire time he was on stage, the close-up of the actor was projected on the wall immediately in front of you. So the easiest thing for the audience was to sit straight in their seats and look straight ahead and see the reproduced image of the Pope. And the entire function of the play was the Pope saying, no, I'm an actual person. There is more to me than my image. And the entire audience spends the entire time watching his image, which is also a close-up, which is much more uh, comfortable to look at, easier to look at. I mean, you know, and th there's something about the reproduced image and, and the sort of images of television that are attractive. You know, in the same, the same energy that means that you're sitting in a bar with the most fascinating person in the world and the news is on and your eye is drifting to the television. That's exactly the condition we wanted to create in the theater. Be and it, it then functioned because that was what the play was about. So we weren't projecting a scenery or setting a place. We were creating this machine basically, that put the audience in this ex the, the same structural relationship with the actor as the Pope was speaking about the Pope's image. So that is an example of the way you can use image and the reproduction of image in the theater to actually help create the conditions that make the story more, more um, poignant or, or pointed. Um, uh, another topic um, that I think is also very true about how we're using projection now is about, uh, is about the density of information. Um, something that's, I think, exciting and that is possible with projection design and the way we can pack information into the moving image is that it can be much more efficient than traditional exposition. Um, to come back to Here Lies Love, there was not a single piece of text in that. There were, there were no spoken words. Everything was sung. And when we received these songs, they were pop songs. Pop songs very differently than musical theater songs. Pop songs are good at defining um, an emotional state, but they don't actually generally have much narrative progress. Musical theater songs do, pop songs don't. And so we were faced with these songs, and then I was given a, you know, 100 page stack of historical information that David Byrne had gathered. And he said, well, this is the story we need to tell. But the story wasn't in, I mean, the songs were snapshots from moments in that story. But your average audience coming to the theater in New York, how much are they going to know about the history of Imelda Marcos? I mean, I knew very little. I remember ever so vaguely the images of 
them being evacuated from the Philippines in 1986. I remember the shoes. Everyone talks about the shoes. But there was an incredible other story there. There was, there was so much information about who she was. She grew up incredibly poor. Um, uh, you know, there's a long history. She, had, she previously had dated Ninoy Aquino, who was her then arch rival. Um, so there was an incredible amount of story that we wanted to tell. And we needed to get past the, what do you know about Imelda Marcos? Oh, it's the shoes. <laughs> and actually tell a story about the history of the Philippines without text. And so the way to do that, what we discovered is we were able to do that with the moving image. You were able to set time and place incredibly efficiently. You know, you can see the flicker of a, of a black and white film and immediately you know, oh, I'm in, I'm in the 40s, right? You know, you're like, I know I'm, or at least I know I'm somewhere between 1935 and, you know, the late 40s, early 50s when color was introduced. You'd like, you, you can set time and place very, very quickly with the moving image. And you, you can provide an incredible amount of information that people are able to absorb much more rapidly than, than would be required if you spent the time uh, talking about all these things and finding reasons for characters to have conversations about who she went to high school with. Um, so that's uh, you know, a very interesting possibility. And it's something that I think is relatively new. There's a wonderful book um, that I recommend every time I speak about this called Everything Bad is Good for You. And it was written by uh, Stephen Johnson. And what he did is he examined a whole series of tropes of things that we generally think of as bad for us. And then went to stud study what their potential positive effects might be. And there was an entire chapter about television because we sort of universally are thinking probably we all watch too much TV and it doesn't make us smarter. And he went and did a study of the progression of the way plots are structured in television. And he then proceeded to chart them all. Um, and here's a couple of his charts. Um, on the uh, far side is the number of plot lines in an episodic, in episodic television show. So he started with Dragnet, circa 1950 some odd, early 60s maybe. Um, and there is one plot line. You start, you know what the story is, you trace the plot directly through the episode and end. And that was true of every single episode of Dragnet. Then you get to Starsky and Hutch, circa 1970, late 70s, I imagine. And there was always two plot lines. There was some sort of tiny little plot they would do right at the beginning. And then you would get into the story and you'd have the story and then they would just wrap up the subplot at the very last step. So you can see there's two lines and you start, you know, each, each horizontal line is a plot line, and the, each vertical column is the amount of time spent on each plot line. Then you move on to Hill Street Blues, which was a revolutionary TV show, much more complicated. And then you move on to The Sopranos, where there's multiple things happening at the same time. And his point was that audiences have learned to track these complex narratives, and that television shows are getting increasingly complex in the way they pack information into a television show. And that audiences, as a result, are responding to that. And they are absorbing information much more readily and, and processing these very complicated narrative structures. The other side is about a, a, a similar study about social networks, right? How many people and how many relationships do you need to keep track of? At the top, we have uh, an episode of Dallas um, from the 80s, which is still relatively complicated because we're already at the 80s. I mean, if you go back and do this for something in the 50s, there would be even smaller networks. And then you look at an episode of 24, and that's, a, that's an episode of 24 tracking all the, inter, the interrelationships between characters in 24. Incredibly complicated plots. So what this means, and why I'm excited about this, is it means that audiences, not just because of television, but any number of reasons, audiences are increasingly sophisticated and increasingly capable of processing multiple streams of information. Again, you know, we also universally talk about the scourge of multitasking, right? And that may be a scourge, but there are skills we're gaining from that about being able to process multiple streams of information. And this is something that I think all of our audiences are doing and something that then allows us, gives us new tools in the theater for how we present information, that you can make a musical not the way we made musicals in the 1950s, 
built for a 1950s audience. We can make a musical for today's audience using, using and maybe pushing what they are capable of processing and, and absorbing. Um, so that's another sort of world of what I think about during the day when I'm talking about how to project into a show. Um, and finally, I think that the third part of this puzzle is about uh, cinematic language. Um, if you think about it, compared to the history of the theater, the motion picture has been around for, you know, a heartbeat. Uh, you know, the very first motion picture was screened in 1896, uh, which was the arrival of the mail train, which Lumiere made, which was literally a film of a train arriving in a station, and that was it. And the very first feature film wasn't screened until 1906. It was an Australian production called The Story of the Kelly Gang. But compared to the, you know, what we're drawing on in the theater where you have the Greeks who were writing plays 2,000 years ago, 100 years is nothing. And what I think is taking place now with projection design and what it allows us to do, and in fact requires us to do, is start to think the way that a, an audience is, that the way that the theatrical vernacular is changing. Right? The jump cut did not exist until Birth of a Nation in the 1920s. Um, you know, the idea of, of cinematic montage did not exist. And so the theater did, hadn't incorporated those ideas. Those are new ideas. And I think that what is beholden on the theater, which is what the theater's been doing since the beginning of time, is looking around it and responding to whatever's going on and stealing all the good ideas we can. Um, I remember like when I was in undergrad, I was taught that all the rigging systems in the theater, in fact, are technology that was taken from sailing ships. That, that in the theater, they said, well, how can we move scenery around? And they looked out at the docks, and they looked at all the technology that was involved in pulleys and ropes and all of the rigging of sailing ships. And they said, well, we'll just repurpose that. And literally, they went out and bought those devices and brought them into the theater and figured out how to move scenery around with them. Well, I think that what projection design do, is doing now is looking at the technology, both literally the technology, but also the intellectual technology, the artistic technology that is involved in how we make motion pictures, how we tell stories in the movies. And we're saying, well, that's what everyone, that is the vernacular. Um, you know, I spend my life in the theater and I'm sure I have seen 10, if not 100 times more film and television than I've seen theater. And I'm, I'm certain, a way above average theater watcher. So that the average person who walks into any theater in the world, the motion picture is their, is their primary language. And that's a great tool. That allows us to do new things. Um, so I'll talk about a production uh, that uh, sort of is an example for that. I did a production, uh, this was one of the productions I did with Robert Woodruff, Woodruff, that we did a series of things at Yale Rep. And this was an adaptation of um, Ingmar Bergman's Autumn Sonata. And when someone first called and said, would you be interested in being the projection designer on an adaptation of a Bergman film? I thought that's about the worst idea I've ever had. <laughs> you know, like, why would I want to go up against Ingmar Bergman? <laughs> it doesn't seem like a good choice. But they, uh, Robert talked me into it, and so we built an adaptation of the script, and there was a, a great deal of projection in it, but there's a particular moment that I think illustrates this, this thing that I'm talking about. In the play, uh, in, the, in the film, there's a mother who's been long absent from her daughter's life, and she comes back, she travels to the north of Sweden to visit her daughter, and eventually, it unfolds that her mother has been horrible to this daughter for pretty much the daughter's entire life. And there's a scene in the middle of the night where they both have too much to drink. And eventually the mother breaks down and apologizes and said, I I'm terribly sorry for, the for everything I've ever done to you. I will never leave you again. Please forgive me. Jump cut. Mom's on a train, <laughs> leaving. So that you have this incredibly rot overwrought scene where the mother you know, pours her heart out. And then it is so incredibly jarring in the film that you go from that emotional moment and then you immediately cut to her well-dressed on a train 
leaving town. And it, it's, 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 it, it's the crux of the film, and it's just like the entire bottom falls out of the film of everything that this woman, you thought this woman was. So the question was, how do we do that on stage? How do we do that same, how do you make the audience's gut sort of drop out the same way that that moment in the film did? And so what we did was stage this entire scene in the middle of the night with too much red line um, without any projection and completely in the dark. And then our version of a jump cut was beyond just cutting it from one image to the next in film, what we wanted to do is switch genres. All of a sudden you're not watching a play, you're in fact back to watching a film. Um, and so the next moment was the mother on the train. And this was entirely shot as a film. We repro reproduced that frame from the Bergman film with our performers and we were able to literally jump cut from not only from one time and place to the next, the way a film does, but what from medium, from one medium to the next. So that uh, you cut from the theater where the mother is present and immediately available to the audience to this very cold and distant representation, cinematic representation of the mother. And she never came back on the stage. That was it. She was gone. From that moment on, she only appeared on film. And it was near the end of the play, so it wasn't all that long, but it was about her exit from the stage. And it was a great way to tell the story that we're trying to tell in the theater using these new tools. Um, and eventually we were also able to commingle these two things so that in this image, what we have is a, a, an image in front of the actor. The woman in the beige coat is live, standing on stage. And then she's sort of inserted into the middle of this cinematic image with her mother appearing on film behind. And they, in fact, they didn't have a conversation, but they had a sort of intertwined piece of dialogue, which in the film is a series of cuts back and forth between the daughter and the mother. And we were able to find a way to put all those things on stage at once. Um, and I think really tell the story of the film, but in a, in a way that a film never could, because you have actual live human beings on stage, which in a film is always stuck at the distance of a film. Um, so, that's, I think, the, th uh, the third big category of, of what I think we're doing. Um, that being said, maybe it's time to move on to how we do this and the actual craft of, of what we're doing, um, which you know is equally important, but I think it's important to remember that all of these sort of crafts and skills and all these things are ultimately there's an end, there's a, there's a reason to do these things, there, there, there needs to be a reason for these things. Um, so, uh, speaking of how we do these things, um, projection design is not new. I think people are talking about it a lot now, but uh, you know, there was a production of, on Broadway, Tommy, the musical was 20, 30 years ago now, I think, 30 years ago. Um, that used a huge, the entire back wall of the stage was a matrix of 35 millimeter slide projectors. I think there was, uh, had to be 40 some odd slide projectors, 35 millimeter slide projectors that were all sequenced and all through the show you saw different images. So that's 30 years ago they were doing that. Um, there was a famous Czech designer, Joseph Svoboda, who in Prague shortly after World War II was using a lot of film projection. Um, before him, there was Erwin Piscator, who was a famous German working between the wars in Berlin and was really at the forefront of the motion picture and how you shove that into the theater. Um, and then before that, there was uh, sort of magic lantern slideshows that existed from the 1650s and became very popular in the 18th century, so that's projection design. And even before that, we had shadow puppets. So this isn't actually new. Um, Except, except I think it's completely new. <laughs> um, why I think it's completely new is that I think the advent of the digital technology and the ability to digitally manipulate these things has so fundamentally changed the nature of the craft that now it, we can be equal participants in a live medium. Um, up until perhaps the late 90s, um, the process of working with video projection or film projection in the theater 
was incredibly laborious, and it had a huge time, there was sort of this incredible turnover in terms of time. If you wanted to change something, you would sit in the theater, you would see something be projected on the stage, you would say you wanted to change it, and then the projection designer would go to an edit suite, and they would work in an edit suite all night, and if you were lucky, you got to see the change the next day. Um, that was when they were vi using video projectors. Before that, if you were talking about film, you would go away, you would re-edit the film, you might reshoot some things, and then you would get the film processed, and then you'd get the film back to the, so that might be five days between taking a note and changing it. Um, and what uh, digital projection, digital video projectors, and digital editing did is it brought it into the theater so that no longer was a projection designer running back and forth between an edit suite somewhere in you know, the far west side. They were in the theater making work with live actors. And that, I think, is the crucial difference, is that now we have a, a, a fighting chance of keeping up with the rate of change of live performance. Because when we make theater, we all sit in a room and we look at the stage, and then we expect to be able to change that. Every di discipline expects to be able to go up there and make changes. And if you can't move at the pace of the, of the greater or organism, for lack of a better word, then you're going to get left behind. You know, I always say directors are, directors are going to solve problems with what's in the room. And if what you have to say to them is, well, in three days I can show you the next version of this, they're not, that's just not going to be the solution. Um, and so really what's changed is it's all become digital. I sort of accidentally, and this sort of happened in my youth, um, I accidentally became the first person to move a video editing suite into a Broadway theater. And I, I didn't know I was the first person to do this. Um, I just couldn't imagine there was any other way to do this thing. Like, I, I, it didn't occur to me that you could make theater with video projection in it without doing that. Because I came from a tradition of a lighting, as a lighting designer and being able to change things in real time. And as it turned out, that was sort of exactly the moment that the technology became available to do this. Um, uh, so, what are the tools of the trade? They break into three basic categories. Um, there is whatever the actual object is that's going to put the image onto the stage. So we're talking about video projectors, much larger than this one sitting on the cart, but the same idea. Um, we're talking about LED screens, as I described, uh, uh, flat panel monitors like large televisions, um, and walls of large televisions we use sometimes. Um, and then there's, a, as I said, a, a bunch of new technologies that are, we're always sort of curious about. Um, there are, there are uh, new types of flat panel, monitor, panel monitors that are transparent. There are printable, changeable uh, papers like in, in the Kindle. So that really, there's, it's, a, it's a medium that's constantly trying to keep up with what is technologically available. And we spend a good portion of our time learning about these new devices. Um, but ultimately, they're, they're in a way not the, the heart of, of how we do this. The real heart of what we do are um, uh, media playback computers that are sequencing all of this content. And I think that's the other, the, they're the sort of heart of how we, how we control what image is seen when and how those images behave uh, in the theater. And they're also the crux of how we control images for live performance. One of the most important things as a projection designer is that we're, that at its heart, this is a discipline for live performance. And when we start bringing pre-recorded media and all of these computers and systems into the theater, it's very easy to lose track of the fact that the human being should be at the center of all this. Um, I don't ever want to tell a conductor what tempo the music should be played at. Because not only is that not my job, that's a conductor's job, but it should change every night. The tempo of a musical number in a musical needs to be controlled by some alchemical relationship between the performers and the conductor and the audience and how warm it is and what everyone had for lunch. Um, you know, who knows what controls those things, but it's something that that entire community in a theater decides in some way or another. Um, and if you lock it to a computer, then 
you lose that thing. You lose the primacy of live performance. And so, unfortunately, that becomes quite a challenge because in, again, talking about how the, the motion picture is the vernacular, people are used to the relationship between the motion picture and its score. And the way they do that in the movies is they edit the entire movie and then they write the music to perfectly match the image. Well, what we need to do is the inverse of that. We need to have them creating the time and speed of the performance every night. And we, every night, need to cut a slightly different movie, in a way, to their pace of performance. Um, so we have big computers that do this. <laughs> and a lot of tricks. We spend a lot of time sort of letting things play, you know, letting loops of ideas play, and then when those sort of ideas are resol re resolved, we can move on and, uh, and various ways to sort of hide the fact that in fact we're cutting together in, in a way a motion picture live every night. And that's all being controlled by usually a stage manager, sometimes m musicians. There's a lot of technology that, that is sort of new that we're using that actually lets the music control the pace and specifics of the image that we're seeing so that I can say, um, okay, let's listen to the microphone on the oboe. And when the oboe reaches a certain volume, do this. And so we can listen to triggers from performers, musicians, talk about the you know, triggers from where an actor is on stage, so that all of the media is ultimately slaved to the people who are still actually live in the room, because I'm not. When it's all done, I leave. <laughs> and you want to build a machine that's ultimately responsive to the humans on stage. So at the center of that are essentially computers. They're called media servers. They, they function a lot like um, you would a computer that edits video, except that time is this sort of loose and flexible idea as opposed to the sort of rigid time in an edit computer. Um, and then finally, and in a way most importantly, is all of the technology and craftsmanship that goes into building the images you're going to see. Um, and while there's some parts of that that are ultimately unique to uh, projection design, it's largely the tools of the motion picture industry. Um, we, occasion we will edit content the way you do in the, in the film industry. We shoot video the, the way you do in the film industry. It's really all of those tools and all those skill sets um, that are, are a major part of what we do. Um, so, that being said, I think we're maybe at the moment where I should let you ask some questions. Um, because if I've spoken enough. I also would love to, would be happy to tell you a bit about a couple upcoming projects, but maybe some questions and I'll have a drink of water <laughs> before I speak too much. <laughs> okay. Um, why? Why introdu uh, introduce film to theater? Why not just leave theater as theater? Um, well, I think, as I said, I think that the theater has, um, I, would, I would ask you why introduce the novel to the theater, right? The theater changed massively after Cervantes wrote the first novel. Is it dimension that you're trying to add? I think it's about, it's about trying to be contemporaneous, right? The theater is ultimately, our job is to reflect and absorb and be built from the world around us, right? And so, I mean, I'm not facetious about the novel. Like, you look at the structure of a play before Cervantes wrote Don Quixote, and you then look at the structure of a play 100 or 200 years after the advent of the novel, and the theater absorbed that cultural change. All of a sudden, the shapes of the stories and the style of the stories that were being told in the world were different, and the theater said, I, you know, not, I don't think anyone woke up and was like, all right, the theater said. But theater makers responded to the cultural, whatever the cultural currents of the day were, and said, these are the ways that people are thinking now. And so I think that's why the theater needs to, not all theater, I mean, the one, my greatest, 
greatest dismay about being a projection designer is that I really rarely get to design sh pl plays or productions that don't have projection. Like I'm by no means saying that every production should do this, but it's a tool, and I think it's a tool that is right for some stories and allows us to uh, absorb something that's in the in the firmament that is the current the current state of the culture. So that's why. I mean, and I'll give you an example, actually. No. I'm going to give you an example because it's actually one of the two things that I'm working on coming up. So I'll, I'll use that as a good segue. I'm working on a new musical called Dear Evan Hansen. And it, it rather involved the plot, so I won't go there. Um, suffice it to say, there'll be a lot of exposition that's done with video in the first <laughs> 10 minutes. Um, but in short, it's about a, a high school kid who a lot of his interactions happen online. It's about him, his loneliness as a, in his physical self and this social milieu that he inhabits that is entirely not real people. I mean, they're real people, but they're not real people that he has a physical interaction with. So it raises that question. You know, those social act interactions happen, right? I mean, it is true that high school kids have to, one of the th things that they are dealing with is this whole series of interactions that are happening online. And as much as the telephone showed up in the theater at some point because all of a sudden people were making telephone calls and then Arto wrote The Human Voice which was entirely about a telephone call. We, we need to find a way to represent those things on stage and the, the, what, so my function in that situation is to find a way to manifest these sort of, this virtual community of people that he's interacting with every day. How do you put that on stage? I, you know, that, so that's like, we have this whole new idea, the, you know, the sort of social networking. How do we put those people on, into the theater and tell stories about them in the theater? And so this is one of those ways, I think. <laughs> the name of the uh, it's called Dear Evan Hansen. Um, and it will, uh, we're still in development. Uh, we'll be working on it in a workshop here in New York this spring, and then out of town at Arena Stage uh, this summer. Uh, and then, you know, like many things, hopefully we'll be coming back to New York. <laughs> but you never, you never can be sure. What else? Hi, I was just wanted to um, ask you, what, in what form do you find you sort of act as most of the time? Like when you're creating content, do you feel like the projections in the theater are mostly used as film or still imagery? Like what's the most, I guess, common version of projection? Do you find yourself acting as a filmmaker more or an animator or maybe a graphic designer? Um, you know, it's interesting. I, I think that, uh, I think one of the, great good fortunes of being one of the few people that do this and or at least at this moment in time I don't think that'll be true anymore is that we're allowed to be incredibly um, uh, diverse in our own work um, that I think that you look at a more um, sort of established uh, profession. You look at lighting designers in the theater or set designers in the theater and, and they have styles. And it may not be that that designer only works in that style, but maybe they become known for a, a certain style. And so then you have the set designer who is expected to do the period realistic interior. And they work in the period realistic interior. And they may be dying to do something else, but once you're known for the period realistic interior, that's what you do, you know, that's what people call you for. Um, so that, I mean, so ultimately, what do I use most? What I think I prize most is that I don't ha I can't answer your question. That, that I've done shows that are purely hand animation. I've done shows that are all live cameras. And there's no pre-recorded material. And it's just cameras filming and reproducing the actors on stage. I've done entirely computer generated, computer animated projects. Um, and so I think it's really about the right tool for the job, and I think that I hope 
we can keep it so that it's about the right tool for the job and doesn't turn into the right designer for the job. So like, oh, that live camera guy, let's go call him. Because I think it, that, um, it's, it's something that I think is also unique. You know, you look at the really, really top-notch visual artists and they don't have a style. They may work in a style for a period of time, but you look at the, you know, I am not making a comparison, but you look at the scope of work that Picasso produced. And there are all these different avenues that they're traveling down in terms of style. There's something at the core of it, but this style is a surface, you know? And so I think that's ultimately true about what devices, is it graphic design, is it filming, is it this or that? I, I try to keep those things as various as possible. It's also a problem, right? Then you need to be good at everything. <laughs> I can't remember the play I saw, but I saw a play that had a lot of visual mm -hmm. projection, and my thought was, oh, they want to save money. <laughs> so, am I right or you know, am I wrong? Let me tell you, projection design does not save money. Oh boy, does it not save money. I mean, basically, my job when it comes to budgets is I, I've all, often joked that I walk into the room and I start off with give me all the money. <laughs> um, it's an, an, in a way almost unfortunately expensive undertaking. Um, you, you know, I was talking about Here Lies Love earlier and the the despite it being an incredible success, one of the biggest problems they have is how expensive it is. Um, the, the media servers alone that run that show are worth a half a million dollars. And that doesn't, that isn't even all of my equipment, let alone the lighting equipment and the sound equipment and all those other things. And also you look at the, at the, the resources and effort that's involved in the content, that's often the mystery, right? Is, and this is true with producers very much, that they get their head around, oh, there's this, there's these projectors and the projectors cost this much money and there's these computers and that costs this much money. But what comes out of them? You know, it's now in completely not news when a feature film costs $100 million to make. Well, that's all labor, right? There, they, all, the, all the effort that goes into making the content is labor. There is no physical product but it doesn't, it nonetheless doesn't remove the fact that there's labor involved in making that, con in making that content. There's also raw materials. Um, often we're using archival material that has to come from somewhere, right? Someone owns the rights to it. Um, or we're shooting material, so then you've got cameras and you've got the crews that shoot films and you've got all that. And then you have the editors and the animators, so that there's an incredible amount of labor that goes into it. And we often mistake how much labor there is, and it's because we've, we've, there's, a, there's a confusion that happens about the scale of theater production and the scale of film and television production. You know, you look at the amount of labor that goes into making an episode of Law and Order SVU, which I did one, one a couple years ago, and those are relatively inexpensive in terms of hour-long dramas. But they're taking the cost that it makes to make an hour of television and they're spreading across millions of viewers. We in the theater, you know, are attempting to make things that are equally complex and we can show it to a thousand people a night if we're lucky. So, you know, the, the, the economics of it is, a, is definitely a serious puzzle. Um, and I, producers often make that mistake. It's like, oh, we'll save some money. I was in a production meeting a couple years ago, and the set was too expensive. And so in the meeting, they went through, we went through from the beginning of the show, we were talking, and they would come to a set piece, and they're like, oh, we'll cut that projection, we'll do it. We'll cut that, the projection will take care of that point, and that plot point, projection can help us there. And they were all legitimate artistic choices on how to tell this story. But at the end of the day, they then added up all the scenery that had been cut, and said, oh, look at that, we've just, cut a quarter, we've just saved a quarter of a million dollars. And it, no one in the room stopped to think, that the replacing of all those physical objects with content, with virtual objects, would cost money. And I set it up and said, you did. You didn't save a quarter of a million dollars, however. You saved maybe $150,000 $150, because replacing all of those pieces of scenery doesn't come for free. 
Like the, the things that we're replacing them with are content and there's labor involved and effort involved and raw materials involved to make those things. So, yeah, sure. Two things, one is it sounded like you, you bring your own equipment as part of that, that's one question. Mm -hmm. The other is, the way you were talking about you need to shoot here and there, does it mean like you're becoming a mini director outside? Sure, uh, so let me start, first of all, in terms of equipment, um, it, it, the current way things mostly are working is that I uh, don't provide any of the equipment that stays with the show, but because the creation of the content is something that both happens in the theater and outside of the theater, and those tools are so much built for and by the people who are making the content, that's part of a studio that I run that is essentially a small sort of film production studio. Um, and then all of that equipment I bring in for the period of where we're making the production. But then I leave them and everything that's mine is part of my studio leaves and they're left with a, a, a system that usually is rented that is this, the machinery that makes the show happen on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, as far as becoming a director, yes, in a way I become this sort of sub-director for very specific moments and it depends on the theater director that I'm working with some of whom are more than happy to just, you take care of that <laughs> and bring it back and I'll talk to you about whether I like it. And others of them want to direct those film shoots like they're a film director. And a lot of times it has to do with exactly how much, how critical the performance issues are in a specific moment that we're filming. You know, if the point is we need to see them on film and that their, their performance as an actor isn't so critical, they'll often leave that to me. If it's a you know, the star of the play and it's a pivotal moment and we need the right performance from an actor, that is not my strong suit. <laughs> um, and so then, you know, so I'll, I, that gets felt out with each director about how that works when we're shooting, certainly. Yeah? Hello. Hi. Um, I apologize, I didn't hear the entire lecture. Sure. But I have a question based on um, theater. Yeah. So, I don't know, did you happen to see the Super Bowl halftime show, anybody? No, I, I was okay. in the theater. <laughs> well, b basically, what I've seen on multiple occasions, I actually saw it on um, Dance With Me, one of those shows. Mm -hmm. They're creating, using projectors, digital scenes mm -hmm. that move, mm -hmm. and the actors are interacting with mm -hmm. almost really nothing. They're really standing on a blank canvas. So my question is, do you see that being something that is gonna be more and more happening as we go on and also, does it also kind of create a way of an actor or actress needing to kind of reinvent the way they act because it becomes a lot harder. When you have a physical something here, mm -hmm. um, it's one thing and to use it and, you know, when you have a, something that's just, you need to know what's gonna happen on the floor because it's just a video playing mm -hmm. from projection you know, I mean, just an example with the Super Bowl, there was a floor and parts of the floor appeared to be falling out and just like concrete with no, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the dancers were all landing literally on these things by hopping, but they can't always be looking at it. They kind of right. just need to know where it is and kind of be in sync with it. Right. So. Uh, I, I do think it's changing some things. I don't think that the theater will ever end up there. I hope the theater will never end up there. That's not, certainly not what I think the future of this is. Um, and in part, I think that's because a lot of those tricks that we see on television work because they're on television. Because what you're seeing is something that then has been filmed and by the, in that process has been sort of flattened. And you are, are, are less aware on television of the distinction between the real object and the virtual object. Whereas when you go to the theater, you're never actually fooled by that. I mean, you know, I, I've never been to the theater and someone projects, you know, the wall of a room and has an actor standing in front of it and I've never been convinced that they're in a room, right? I'm, I'm always aware of that artifice. And I think that the, what's the, the trick about that is that there's, that's true of scenery as well in a way. You don't actually expect it to be real, but it doesn't purport to be. And I think that that's something that ultimately the, the, the physicality of actors in a space is... Paramount. That being said, I think what will happen is that I think scenery will become more abstract and 
uh, and the images we expect to see, the context that we expect to see an actor in, will become more abstract and more malleable. I think of, if any of you have seen uh, The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Night, um, it's an excellent example of that, where they're basically on a blank slate. Now, for the most of the production, they never try to create a realistic environment for these people to be in, but they are creating a canvas that image can resolve itself on. Um, I do think that actors, I mean, I spend a lot of time talking to actors about what it means to act, not a lot of time, but, you know, I, what does it mean to act in these environments, whatever they are, with image? Um, because it's, a, it's as much as, I, as I said, if, if we're doing our job right, we're revolutionizing the theater, and we're all doing that. <laughs> you know, I mean, the actors are hopefully coming along with for the ride, and they're the ones who are doing the harder work. Um, and about what it means to stand on a stage with these images, what it is to have a relation, to understand how those images are part of this bigger um, whole that we're making. So I do think that changes. And then those squares in the Super Bowl were probably driven by the dancers. Just saying. The, 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 the where those pieces of solid floor were, were probably being generated live. So they were responding to the dancers as opposed to the dancers responding to them, would be my guess. <laughs> Which is a whole other thing. <laughs> yeah, so just in secondary to that, one of the other things I saw was, and, and I remember it was America's Got Talent, and it was mm. a ballet. They were doing ballet, it was two mm. performers, and they were stationed in, like the scenery was not supposed to appear that it wasn't a projection, mm -hmm. but it's just very dynamic. Mm -hmm. And their entire movements and their whole performance was, again, based as they were doing things, the scenery was working with them. Mm -hmm. And all it takes is kind of just a little foot this way where it, it doesn't work out, you know? Right. I, I think there is a level of, preci of precision that this sometimes calls for. Again, you know, one of the important things though is I think building, building these machines so that actually instead of them, instead of requiring precision from the performer, you require flexibility and adapti adaptability from the technology so that you get the technology to respond to the performer instead of the performer to respond to the technology. Always at the center the live human being. Otherwise, we should be making movies. <laughs> because, and if not, we have to keep it about live humans. We have, you know, that's what has, the theater has to be about, so. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Sure. Very informative, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, this entire quandary of uh, the theater live versus the projected, mm -hmm. uh, it seems like it's actually a matter of personal preference in the marketplace. People that would want to see pure theater without any of the effects, those things can be available to those people and they can go and enjoy that kind of a production. And for other people who like the mixed elements of bringing the technology into it. And I very appreciate your contextualizing the projection aspect of this in terms of it uh, uh, being derivative from the cinematic medium that we've grown up in today, and it's kind of a, a paradox for the theater, which gave birth to the cinema in a way, and to have the child now uh, overtaking the parent, in a sense, is probably subconsciously made people feel emotionally, <laughs> too, watching all of this. Um, as example, I went to a 3LD production called Frequency Hopping, which was about Hedy Lamarr uh, pioneering anti-torpedo technology for World War II, and that was a multimedia overload with also robotic instruments playing pianos on stage, uh, rear projected video, uh, front projected video, and live performers. It was very ambitious and they fought very much with this very idea of how to keep it live. Mm -hmm. And you could see where it got off base with that and suffered. And there were other moments in the show where the performances, the performers kind of rallied and they had their moment, but you could really notice this, this eccentric kind of nature to the whole performance. And it was a great show. The content itself was very fascinating and very in earnest, but it was a weird, because I was there totally gung-ho trying to watch it happen. Mm -hmm. And I got caught in this weird like flux between the two things. Uh, another analogy I would make too is recently the premiere of the hologram of Michael Jackson, uh, which did the same thing to me. Mm -hmm. 
an astounding performance, fantastic, that has been recorded for posterity holographically, but it really had this creepy valley right. aspect to it, yeah. too, mm -hmm. uh, where you knew the more real it made him see seem, the creepier it got because right. you were conscious of the fact that it wasn't him. So yeah. you, there's no escaping those, those metaphysical facts. Yeah, that. well, and I think what's interesting about all of this and, and is something that I constantly try to remind myself and the people I work with is that this, you know, as I, yes, it has been going on for centuries, but it really, the situation we're in now is quite new. And um, the, you know, the fact that we're trying to create a, a, a discipline in the theater without a, without a history, that I, I couldn't go and look at, well, how has it been done 100 years ago? How was it done 50 years ago? So we're not very good at it, <laughs> to be honest. Like, we're still figuring this out. You know, they're talking about the balance, like how do you get the balance between these things and the actor, and how do you, strike that pitch. And it's like, well, you know, we don't have 300 years of the history of the modern ba of ballet to, to help us lean on. We're still sort of struggling our way through that. And the tools are phenomenally unresponsive. You know, it's like, I found myself one day talking about the, my life in the theater. And it's like, you know, the amount of technology between me and it, me expressing myself on stage, it's sort of like, you know, being an astronaut trying to thread a needle in a spacesuit. Like, it's, it's, you know, there are so many computers and so many things between me and expression. And obviously that's a choice I've made, but getting those things to behave in a human way, you know, I mean, getting all of that, those devices to be responsive and, and behave humanistically is in fact quite a challenge and it's something that I think is a new challenge that we're, that the theater is still struggling with um, to sort of, tame these new ideas and get good at them. Peter, yeah. I would like to thank you so much for such a comprehensive overview of this burgeoning industry. I mean, it seems to me like incredible the impact it's going to continue to have on every play production. I was going to say it was going to be, it's probably going to be part of every play until you mentioned that budget will play a part because <laughs> I'm afraid I was one of those people who assumed that people would be saving money by using theater projection, but now I know differently. <laughs> so, Well, and like I said, I hope it isn't. I, I love theater without projection. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I would just like to thank you on behalf of the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen um, and Victoria Dangle. <laughs> I'm just gonna, oh, yes, and Peter, thank you. We'd like to make a presentation to you. Oh, thank you. Yes. So first of all, Peter, a little memento. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. And on behalf of the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen, thank you so much for your participation in the labor portion of our Labor, Literature, and Landmark series and for all the work you put into this lecture. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And of course, we have made you an, on an honorary member of the library, oh, so you we so hope you'll come back and I visit. I will. I want to Please see the box. Do. Yes, oh, okay. Yes, I, of course. I just read about that today. How have I missed this all my life? So. <laughs> well, you can, have, you can have a private tour of the Lock Museum, and we invite anyone else here. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank you all for coming this evening. I'd like to invite you to have a, share, have a glass of wine and a piece of cheese, and perhaps um, if you have any questions, I'm sure Peter would be happy to answer them. But I also want to take this opportunity because our next Labour lecture, Abe Jacob is here this evening. He is the Broadway sound man, and we were, we were absolutely honored to have him, and Abe will be here next month. Abe, would you like maybe just to... Thank you. Thank you. Yes, say hello. Thank you very much. Again, thank you so much for coming. Peter, many thanks on behalf of the General thank Society. Thank, thank you, you so much. Me.